So hi everyone and welcome back. This is the second part of our interview with Bren from the Bright Anne Library. Enjoy. Yeah, I wanted to ask in terms of all of the stuff that you've read, because you've read, I'm sure you've read most, if not all, of the stuff that you bought. Um, <laughs> that's <is> not true. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's 300 <laughs> books back there. <laughs> and I'm sure you've read a decent amount. Um, I have. Say, um, is there <laughs> any books that you've read that really, you said that you've learned a lot from some of the stuff you've read. Is there anything that really resonated with you or really helped you in, in some way or, you know, anything that you just really loved reading that you really just enjoyed? Yeah, I think... I can see both of these books actually on your bookshelf behind you, um, but the Bible duology. Oh, I think I just pulled something. Um, <laughs> uh, ooh, it's coming off really bright, but um, it's a collection of uh, uh, personal essays by um, M. Spec people, and it's uh, beautiful. It's it's a beautiful collection, but this is like an example of the kind of thing that I really love reading and it makes me feel um, so whole and, and warm inside every time I do is I actually personal narratives. The old ones as well, where like- this I is have the old one too. Yeah, this is when they made- It's me, loaned out right now. <laughs> this is when they made it first and then they rebranded it when they made the second one, which I'm in, I'm in the second one. The first one looks like even more religious, which I think is yeah, funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, but I love personal essay collections. I've got a lot of them back there. Um, and they're, they're precious. They're precious to me. If I, if someone was like, you have to get all rid of all but one genre of book, that'd be the one I keep. Because I think it's the most valuable thing to listen to the voices of other people in our community who are not necessarily exactly like you. Yeah. If we're only looking to reflect our own by experience, our own pain experience. I don't think we're growing and we don't know how to help our own community either because that's something I feel like we need to do a lot more of is like take care of each other first and then have a war with the people outside our community who don't understand us second um that's my personal opinion um so yeah I like reading about individuals so like there's a really good book called recognize the voices of bisexual men um let's see there's so many <laughs> yeah oh this is a really good one that i got uh, like a month or two ago it's called blessed by spirit bisexual people of faith and it collects people from a host of uh faith backgrounds uh, about finding or losing or enhancing or struggling with their faith um in the ways that it meshes together with their bisexuality um it's absolutely beautiful um, I, I'm excited to have time to read all of it. I've only, I read like a few things here and there. Um, it's amazing though. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it's the only one like it where it's a bi collection specifically about faith, um, which is, uh, something we could talk about more. I think mm -hmm. that there's lots of bi people of faith, just like there's queer people of, of all kinds who are religious or spiritual in some way. Um, and it's, that doesn't have to be divorced from our identity. It's interesting that you mentioned recognize as well, because I, <laughs> I was at the moment um, because I heard that there was a good essay in there about phalliocentrism. I don't know how you say that mm -hmm. word. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a topic that I wanted to touch on in my book about why bisexual men are often seen as gay rather than bisexual and why bi women are often seen as straight rather than bisexual and why it's always the attraction to men and try and break that down a little bit and then discuss how um, you know when people say that you know when we don't experience homophobia and it's like well we do and even though you know women get assumed to be straight they still experience homophobia um but I wanted to like delve into that and how the homophobia affects us and the internalized hom homophobia affects us as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think personal essays are great. I think, so before I got into the second one, um, I bought the first one, so that's why I have the original cover. And I went, was going to America and I bought it just in time for my flight. And I um, 
was reading it before the plane took off, read one essay, started crying, and it was like, Let, that's, that's enough of that. And I, just put the <laughs> I was like, really, you read one story and you're just like bawling your eyes out. And then I read, I watched two films on the flight that were both made me cry. So I just spent the whole, like, I think eight, six to eight hour flight on the way to America, just crying incessantly. So I'm really glad that there was no one, like the two seats next to me were just not populated for some reason. So I was just like sitting there in this empty row, just crying. Um, so that was fun. That was a great time. I've cried more than once reading the personal essay things. They, they touch something like inside because you don't grow up. I, I think, especially people like our age, I think it's changing for Gen Z and, and below, um, but you don't necessarily grow up knowing that other kids are bi or that you're bi. I didn't know. I thought I was straight till I was in my early 20s. Like, I have a video of me saying that I was straight and cis that is dated a month before I came out to the first person. Like, like <laughs> I was very convinced until the last moment there. Um, so we don't know to look for each other. And how, how would we? How would we know? Back, back on these shelves, I have four books that are for middle grade and below. Wow. Four. And they're the ones I've been able to find as far as I'm aware that's all that exists the one thing I'm missing is Rick Riordan's Trials of Apollo series which where the main character is by is a whole series and it's really cool um that's the only one I don't have though there's nothing for kids so if anyone's watching please donate that book um <laughs> yeah <laughs> please buy one for kids <laughs> please write that book like <laughs> Please, I'm, I'm begging you, write that book. Um, so, big scary question. Um, if, God forbid, you know, your house were to flood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my nightly terror. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would be the books that you would grab and save if you had to pick some, if you can? Mm. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the out of print ones. Um, like I said, the ones that I mentioned before, before bisexual lives and bisexual horizons by the off pink collective. Absolutely. Um, hmm. Hmm. Let me just, let me just look for a second. <laughs> yeah. The used ones, anything that I could purchase new again, I wouldn't get. Let's see. Um, This would probably be in there, although you can buy it new, but it's important to me. Um, I would probably grab this one, uh, Bisexual Politics, Theories, Queries, and Visions. I found this in a thrift store. This is, the, this, is, this is the one that I found just accidentally in a thrift store. And I was like, if there's a God, they want me to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I do have some older, ooh, actually, here we go. Okay, let's talk about this. Speaking of smut, <laughs> um, I have some old erotica written for straight people um, that are very difficult to find online. Yeah. Some of them, there's no information about them online at all. Um, this one says bisexual on the front. Eve's sexual fantasies led her into the thrilling eroticism of bisexual passion. Um, and this is from, I want to say the 70s. Wow. Yeah. Um, and there's other ones. What you always wanted to know about switch hitters. Oh. That one's graphic. Um, the three-way household, which I want this cover is as. I like it as a I poster. This, <gasps> exactly. Like oh I may scan it and blow it up to be a poster. Cause it's oh beautiful. God. This girl has pink hair. Oh my God. That is, and this is, is it's so good. <laughs> It's so beautiful. And it's, this is from 1974. Wow. And it's about a, like a, a throuple, an actual throuple, like they live together. Um, so those I would definitely save because they would be very hard to replace um, and they were not super cheap to get. I'm so intrigued about the history behind this. Maybe there was like the reason why it only existed in that genre in the seventies is because that was the only genre you could write bisexuality in. Um, maybe 
maybe the reason why like maybe the people who are writing it were actually bisexual like who knows that is very possible like I, I having know. having read them especially because they are yes bisexuality is on the cover or there's women kissing on the cover but this is porn <laughs> <laughs> this is porn. Um, there's pictures in here, like like actual photographs. Oh wow! That is pornography. Um, it's very beautiful. Um, the beginning chapter, the first chapter, presents the book as a psychological exploration. It's it sh- it it frames it as an intellectual thing, an educational book, and then it go- moves like like that into like body parts being <laughs> um, uh, fondled so <laughs> i'm trying to keep this youtube appropriate um it's it's really interesting because it, it even though it's on the face ob- obviously queer they frame it in such a way that you could have an out if somebody asked you about it where you could be like, actually, this is just um, a, a, a psychological overview of this kind of person, this kind of pervert. It's um, these photographs, science. Um, <laughs> it, 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 and then it closes the books the same way. Nothing in the middle is like that. It is erotica, written largely for straight men, is, is the impression you get. Um, I love the idea of a psychologist buying it and being like, time to learn about bisexuality. And then <laughs> who would be like... <laughs> yeah. It's I, really I interesting. Just, just imagine the person writing it if they weren't bisexual and literally just going like, I'm going to do a thought experiment and then just go have like crazy <laughs> sex. Like... Yeah. And just having like the threesomes and the orgy, like whatever, whatever it took to learn about bisexuality. You know, it's all in the name of science. It's science. <laughs> Method actors who? No. <laughs> I think it's very much how it comes across. Like, oh, I was gonna say, I think we all went through the like, oh, I'm just testing it out, what it's like to kiss my female friend, uh, you know. And it is really affirming to know that even in like the 70s, people were still doing the, the, you know, I'm kissing my friend in a nightclub for boys' attention. It's not just because I want to kiss my friend in a nightclub. (laughs) Yep. We find ways to give ourselves permission. If society doesn't give us permission, we find other ways to do it. And like this way of doing it is kind (laughs) of exploitative to a degree, I would say. Um, not because it's porn, but because of how it's marketed. This was not, for instance, um, everything you want to know about switch hitters full of, uh, pictures of women having sex is not marketed towards women. So it's really interesting. Like who got permission back then and who didn't. That is fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I need to find, I need to like Google these people and find out what they're doing now. I just, I need to know. I'm just, I need to like find them and like find some weird like Facebook or Twitter that they have and just be like, oh, you're the person who wrote this. <laughs> what is your life like? What are you, how are you? I just, I need to know. I need to know what you're doing. Also, it could be I- almost impossible because oh. they're almost all under pen names. Mm. Uh, of course they especially, are. Especially the on its face erotica, yeah. It'd be hard because it wasn't accepted. Like you could make a living from it. It wasn't accepted still. I'll, I'll hire up EI. But I also want to find out. Look, if you do, like, loop me in on the briefs because I want to hear. <laughs> I also think as a community, we need to start. I love the term switch hitter. I think it's fantastic. It's so good. I want us to, so like, good. why don't we use it? It's so good. When I, before I came out, well, obviously I was out at this point but so I came out 14 I was like one of the first people in my school to come out I was definitely the first of my friends um and so I was like you know a cabinet of curiosities to people um Mm -hmm. and one of the things I used to say is when people asked me about it I used to say I bat and I field 
and so that's like, fun and so I'm like I want to bring the, those terms back I bat and I field I'm a switch hitter <laughs> I love that. it's Excellent. great there's a Joan Jett song who is a bi legend um called baby blue where she sings about someone being a switch hitter <sighs> and playing the field it's so good look it up great song <laughs> And this is like the conversation to bring it back because we've, we've come off books now, but to bring it back, this <laughs> is the conversation that access to our literature allows for. And when we don't mm -hmm. have access to that and when it's hidden and erased, like, I don't know about you guys, but I often find, so I have a Google alert for bisexual setup because uh, I'm a yep. nerd. Um, and you get the same cycle of, articles every week or so it's like such and such yeah. celeb come out such and such said they didn't know they were bi until this five things not to say to bisexuals like the conversations we have just we keep having and it's because I think that we don't have easy access to all the literature and the canon of what's already been written that we keep writing the same thing over and over again <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think we've spoken about this on our channel before, just like, mm -hmm. it's not even just, uh, you know, on, on Google or on articles, it's on Twitter, it's on, even in LGBTQ plus spaces, like, we were looking at, uh, you know, the conversation that was happening, I mean, it was in Glasgow LGBT, um, it wasn't even LGBT, it was gay and lesbian centre, and that conversation is a conversation still happening to this day. And it has been three decades and we're still repeating it. And you've got to question yes. why. You've got to question what's going wrong, where people are not learning or moving forward. It feels like a lot of the communities have stepped forward and bisexuality is stuck in the same loop. And we don't know why. Yeah. I think often we're baited into not moving forward as a community. We are baited into fighting with each other we're baited into dis like hating other people who use different words to describe similar experiences um, when we could be so much stronger together and like just not care that much about what specific words we choose if we have similar experiences and resources we need. Um, I think the whole bi versus pan debate is such a huge waste of our time. I have a book back here from the 70s where people are identifying as pansexual. Our words have evolved with, at a very similar rate, a very different, a very similar, like a very similar timeline together, enmeshed, same community. Um, and the fights that we've had about it have taken a much different tone in the past decade. But reading books from the 80s, from the 90s is so illuminating to me um, because you, it might as well have been written now other than the political things happening around around the authors, it rings completely true. They didn't have the internet, but they still have people policing who they can or cannot date as bi people, or who they can or cannot date to be accepted, or what, they, uh, what sexual acts will um, initiate them into bisexuality or into queer culture. Um, what kind of presentation are they allowed to take on? What kind of words are we allowed to say? What words do we have any ownership over? Um, words that definitely applied to us before there was this very modern delineation between bi and gay or lesbian or words that came before or non-words that came before. Mm -hmm. um, a very Western, very modern, modern thing that we just fight over all the time. And it's a, it's a waste. It's a waste. It's such like, a waste. Yeah, I've, I've spoken about this before because I wrote um, like a short, I think it was like a two minute blog piece about like, you know, what's the difference between the two? And I just left it at that. And most of the time this comes up with very confused monosexuals who are like, I don't get why there's both. And it's like, you don't have to, just shut up. <laughs> just shut up and stop asking, stop bringing it up. They both exist. That's all you need to understand. It's like, what's the difference? Who cares? Why do you care? And I think I ended my article, it was like, bi and bad people have so much solidarity for each other. And that's the end of it. Like, stop trying to put a wedge in, stop trying to explain the difference, stop trying to define them, just let them both exist. Let the chips fall. 
and move on. It's so, it's so irrelevant. It's so pointless. Just accept them. Like, yeah. I and accept each other. Cause I like, I, I do think that often we are baited into this by people who will benefit or feel more secure themselves from dividing us. I think that happens. Yeah. Um, I also think that like, we're still responsible, like as a community, if bi people are invalidating pan people, which does happen, you can find it, you can see it happening. I've certainly seen it in my last five years on the internet. Yeah. We're responsible for calling that out in our own community and the same for pan people who police, who can use bi or not, um, or any other labels that like infight um, when we have so much more in common than we don't, than not. Um, like taking community responsibility though, Re requires having a broader context for ourselves. And I do think that that's what this kind of reading helps with because it centers you like in your own experience makes, can, has helped at least me feel more secure in my own experience so that I am able to be nuanced and less defensive with other people with similar experiences, but different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, which is very important, like the ability to be humble and be like, I didn't know that. I don't know why you chose this word instead of the word that I use, but I have, to, I, I accept that. And I refuse to take that as a threat to myself. Cause that is, I think that's such a huge part of it. Yeah. We are responding to other people who use different words as if it's a divisive thing rather than a, a valid response to what the world puts like plurisexual or M spec people through. Mm -hmm. It puts us through so much that hurts so deeply. And people respond to that. Some, some bi people choose bi because it roots them in history and like that fight and like um, they like that or they just like the colors better. That happens too. Um, and some pan people, they're just so tired of trying to explain themselves that they have chosen a word that has less history that is, um, that will, maybe they don't want to fight every day about like the idea that bi is a binary or no, it's not, or um, this is just valid. And so they choose a word that will get them less resistance and that's what they need to survive. Mm -hmm. Or they feel like that's definitely like the next evolution we should take as a community and we should do, you choose a new word, which is a common thing I'll see in books back here from the seventies, eighties, nineties, people being like, well, should we keep the word bisexual? It was put on us by psychologists. It was a medical term. Do we keep this? Gay people didn't keep homosexual as, as their main label. So should we keep bisexual? We've chosen to reclaim it largely as a community, but there isn't been broad agreement about that. And I think refusing to be defensive about that truth about our history will do so much good for us because then we'll be able to connect with each other and support each other in a way that straight people and gay and lesbian people don't overwhelmingly do i think a lot of these fights that we have come from the trauma that we will put through in just like finding and being who we are and when you've spent so long fighting mostly straight people but like monosexual people in general to have that label and to create space for yourself it can be hard to differentiate what um Someone I was interviewing recently used the term dead cat, which I think is great, um, which is like when you're debating someone and they're not debating in good faith and they're throwing dead cats over your fence. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I think this is fantastic. It's such a great term. It was Jane Fay um, who used this. She's a trans journalist. She's amazing. Um, and so when you are picking up these dead cats and to throw them back, or to get rid of them, and there's just more dead cats being thrown at you, sometimes, to extend the metaphor, you can miss the live ones. <laughs> 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 what I'm saying makes no sense. But, <laughs> but it's a great visual. I'm having a very good time up here. <laughs> and you've spent so long arguing against people who want to invalidate you in bad faith. It becomes very difficult to differentiate between the people who are arguing in good faith and trying to have an actual conversation. Um, yeah. And I think that links back in a very obscure way. <laughs> you know, once you've 
when you've spent so long being validated, any criticism, any discussion can feel like invalidation. Very much. Very much. I think that's something we have to be very understanding about with each other. Like, oh, I know patience is in short supply and it's because of this, but like, I hope we can find more for each other. Yeah, and I think, you know, giving access to resources like you're doing and hopefully with the wave shifting a little bit where more mainstream press are wanting to do uh, mainstream publishers are wanting to do positive stuff for bisexuality, yeah. that that education and resources will provide the shift so we can move on from these very mundane conversations and actually move on to like, hey, our mental health sucks and we're in poverty. Let's fix that instead of what label I'm using. How about them? Uh, and, you know, I think having stuff like, you know, Buy Health Month is a really mm-hmm. important thing because we need to start having that conversation. We need to start yeah. having the conversation of, well, why is bisexual mental health so much worse than gay and lesbian? There's, there's a discussion that needs to happen there. And I think having these resources and having these experiences and having the personal essays is really going to help change that. Yeah. Um, so, Bren, thank you so much. We've taken up quite a lot of your time, uh, but this has been really... No, this has been fun. I could go for another hour. <laughs> We've had so many videos that we've had to like divide in half because like this is a thing that Vinny and I are big nerds about. We could talk about it forever. <laughs> um, Same. So where can people find the BiPan library? So our website is bipanlibrary.com. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, all at BiPan Library. On TikTok, I do reading videos. So if you want to hear from these books, you can go on TikTok and hear me read from them. Um, and I sometimes do lives reading as well. So awesome. um, there's that. I share about individual books on Instagram and on Twitter. I do almost nothing because I don't like it there. Um, but I, we do update on like the blog post and things there. So feel free to follow us. Um, yeah, and shoot me an email if you need help researching something. Um, if you're looking for a specific topic, you can email me at bypanlibrary at gmail.com or there's a contact form on the website. I would I would be so delighted <laughs> Ooh, thank you so much for joining us and for it's been amazing just to see them all in the background honestly I'm glad I'm glad I like knowing that people can see them other than me in my house by myself <laughs> so I love your channel so much oh thank you um, I've watched every single video I've followed it since you started it I think thank so you. <laughs> um, I'm thank honored you. I'm honored to be here well, well, I'm sure we'll have you on again. Oh, I'll just let me know when. I'll come <laughs> back. We can talk more about serial killers. <laughs> cool. Thank oh, you uh, so much for watching. Um, yeah. We will be back next month because we are monthly now because Vanit and I uh, have decided to love ourselves a bit more and not work constantly. Um, so, yeah, see you guys next month. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you guys.